Welcome into a News for Jags podcast. I'm Jamal St. Cyr alongside Justin Barney. Justin, you know, uh, game day kind of inching closer and closer and closer. Yes, big week. Man, it is uh, big exciting. I, I wish it was in town, but uh, Arrowhead Stadium. The Dolphins let us down. I mean, the Dolphins let us down. Another Florida team just, let, just letting that. Jacksonville is the hope of Florida. We kept talking it, about it, you know, going in. This was the first time since 1999 all three NFL teams in Florida were in the playoffs. Only one left standing. So does right. that make the Jaguars the best team in the state of Florida? I think it does. That's right. You know, 99, was that also that AFC Championship season for the Jaguars as well? So had the Ravens been Good. able to, to punch it in there and help us out there, and had the Dolphins been able to hold on to that game against the Bills, we'd be talking about another home game. But instead, it's in, in Kansas City, yep. a great place to play. That's and right. Trevor Lawrence, I, I thought it was awesome that he said uh, in his media availability this week that – you know, he was asked about playing in Kansas City yeah. and how loud it was. And he said, oh, it's, it's crazy loud, but it's not going to be as loud as, as it was last Saturday night from our <laughs> home fan. So cool, that little shout out. Trevor knows how to play the game. He knows how to do it. He's a man of the people. The Waffle House visit. The, the man of the people, the Waffle House king. Yeah, and, you know, and I thought, it, <laughs> I thought it was cool earlier in the season. It was telling of Trevor to say, you know, people – the anti Zach Wilson people spend their hard-earned money on on tickets to go to games and watch us win, watch us play. They want to see victories. They don't want to see what we've been turning in on the field. So Trevor, sure. an appreciation again. He's endeared himself to fans. Uh, take away the football aspect of, it, but he's endeared himself just to the common man, the fans. He hears it, the boos, the upset things about the fan during that streak. So right. it's really cool to hear that from from a professional athlete that he knows what. The fans are going through and stuff. And, and then to go out and eat at Waffle House after a game, I mean, what else could you like? Florida Man Hall of Fame. Florida Man Hall of Florida Fame. Florida Man Hall of Fame. And he's got the long hair to go with it. All we need is like the, the, the Minshew bandana, right. and, we're, and we're rocking and rolling. We're good. No, I mean, Tre- Trevor's done everything that you want from him um, at this point, and now he has another big task in front of him. Year two, he's already in the playoffs, got his first playoff win under his belt, and now he gets the chance to try – and go into Kansas City and knock off one of the powerhouses um, of the NFL. And Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes, not going to be easy this week, you know. Uh, but one of the things that I guess that defense has called themselves the J-Villains. <laughs> J-Villains, and, you know, a villain would like to go into somebody else's home stadium and send them home crying. Mm-hmm. So if you're going to be a villain, you got to do it the right way, do right? It, do it right. So <laughs> it's a second trip this year. For the Jaguars, they lost in Week 10 up there, 27-17. We touched on that briefly uh, earlier this week in our News for Jags podcast. But it's playoff time. It Anything is, is, is I mean, every it's, it's win or go home. And, you know, we'll talk about that matchup, early, the, the early season matchup. But you're so different. He, uh, Trevor mentioned, you know, Week 10 seems like a lifetime ago. Same thing with the Chargers game. You know, Week 3 it was 38-10. You really don't learn a lot from that. Right. It's late in the season, the injuries and roster shakeups and stuff like that. So, it, yeah, it's, it helps that you played up there in that environment. You've seen how loud those fans, you've heard how loud that environment is. But, again, it's it, the Jaguars feel like a different team than they were in Week 10. Very different team. I mean, a lot has changed since then. The light hadn't come on. This team is has learned how to finish games. They're in a whole different environment. I know not a lot of people nationally are giving them a, much of a chance, but I think that's just because – you know, they still have that lingering, ah, that's just the Jaguars kind of thing. And even seeing the team fall down 27 to nothing, and they're like, ah, you can't do that against the Chiefs, which this team knows they can't, but this is a very different ball. It's going to be a very different ball game than the first go around. I, I think they have a shot. And even when you look at the rosters, which is what we're going to kind of do in today's episode, is kind of uh, go through both rosters and even make some uh, comparisons and things like that on, on what the Jaguars would need to do. Um, but... I don't think this game is as far gone as many people nationally are leading you to believe. I know the Chiefs are the the heavy mm-hmm. favorite. I think eight and a point, eight and a half points right now, but I think it's going to be closer than that. that you know, I, I, I have, we've touched on this. You you brought it up quite a few times this year, uh, especially during the the struggles of the Jacksonville Jaguars sure. when they get hot. The '96 season. I, yep. I went back. I wrote a story on this today or yesterday, um, and it is remarkable the similarities between those two teams, those two years of the teams. Okay, right. we're talking about the second-year Jaguars franchise. Yep. Okay, let me let me throw out some of the parallels. All right, of, throw them out. Let's this. do it. Okay, and, and again, it, it's tough to say history repeating itself because right. that, team, that team was special. Look, but the, I, the I, Matrix is, in, is stuck in a cycle. <laughs> we're just in a rerun. This is just a rerun. We've yeah. all seen the Truman Show. That's true. That's true. <laughs> so, 
you know, okay, 96, and I was a kid back in, in the, the mid-90s, and mm -hmm. um, 95, that first season was remarkable. You got your NFL team and stuff. You got 4-12, and 12, okay. So let's talk about the, the 96 and the 2022 similarities. You've talked about them a little bit before. Let's yeah. re re refresh, let's do revisit it. this. Okay, the 96 team, the 2022 team, okay, both those teams had terrible years the year before. Right. Okay, the 95 Jaguars, 4-12, and 12, expansion mm -hmm. team, the 2021 Jaguars, three and fourteen. Okay, yeah. remember there was seventeen game season now, sixteen game season back then. So right. four and twelve, four wins, three wins. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that that's comparable. Okay, that Very ninety close. that ninety six team was also three and six at the, at the same point through nine games of the season. Mm -hmm. This year's Jaguars team, three and six. Okay, you get to that point, and how do you how do you start off that torrid kind of stretch? Okay, you had a um, you win five of your last. You win five. You go on a five-game winning streak. Ah, both. But did you skip one? Both teams. What's that? Did you skip one? You skipped two, actually. Did I skip two? You skipped two. Okay. So well, here, here's the other parallel. Both teams, their kind of hot streak of yeah. sorts started with a big comeback win over the Baltimore Ravens. 30-27 ah. in 96 but and 28-27 Here's, 28, 27 here's this the year. other one. They followed up the next week by getting blown out, both teams. This year against yep. the Lions, them the against the Steelers. Steelers. Yes, big, ah. big losses. So... 40 to 14 uh, mm -hmm. against the Lions, and I believe 28 3 against the Steelers. Mm -hmm. So you're comparable in blowout percentage there um, <laughs> against that. You start off, you, you start that massive streak at the end mm -hmm. with a win over the Ravens, right? Over the Ravens, that's right. That's the, the, the run. That started the run, the, the first of five consecutive wins to end the season. You also had an overtime win in those five wins mm -hmm. in that five-game winning streak. There was a, an overtime win over the Cowboys this year yep. in overtime. So both of those tail end of the five-game winning streaks had overtime victories yep. in there. So going into your final week of the regular season, you absolutely needed a win and you're in mm -hmm. a, a scenario. So against the Jaguar in the 96 Jaguar season, it was against a banged up Atlanta Falcons team that was going nowhere. And again, you need a, a must win this season against a banged up Titans team yep. that was struggling on a losing streak. And you, you go up in that Atlanta Falcons game, 17 to three, I believe, if you're on, on the ropes in that Titans game, but you right. needed a late comeback or you needed a massive play at the end of both of those games. Yep. This one happened, this year happened to be a scoop and score defensively. Oh, yep. In 96, you needed it, a ceremonious slip for Morton Anderson, one of the best kickers in field goal <laughs> history. I remember where exactly where I was watching that game. Jaguars down night or winning 1917. Morton Anderson a 30 yard field goal, a chip shot. He makes that probably in his sleep most days. Mm -hmm. He misses it. The Jaguars go on to win that game. There you go. 1917. They win. Get in as a wild card team. We saw what happened. Uh, they go on the road first round. Your favorite. You're you're not favored in that game. You're an eight and a half point underdog against the Bills. What happens? You win 30 to 27, beat the Chargers again with the most, one of the biggest comebacks in NFL history. So many similarities. Trevor Lawrence has played in 35 career games. Both quarterbacks were in their second year of starters in the NFL. Right. Mark Brunel had played 34 games in the NFL at that point in his career. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you're talking so many similarities between those teams. And then again, the second round of that 96. The game you go in that 96 season, you go on the road against the number one seeded again, Denver Broncos, AFC West team coming off a bye in the first round. The Chiefs coming sure. off a bye, AFC West team. What do you, what happens? How do you rewrite? I mean, there's so many similarities between 96 and, and this season's team that I'm not going to say that an upset is guaranteed. But it's in the universe. It's out there. Oh, and, and look, one you left out, both teams finished the regular season with nine, nine wins. wins. Nine wins. Nine okay, I, I'm not saying, that, like I said, it's not, I'm not saying it's a rerun, but it might just be a little bit of a rewrite. You know, uh, what, what, what do we do now? All the movies are, are becoming new again. Right. They're just taking it and remaking it. Right. So they just took 1996. They were like, oh, you know what? That's a really good story. Let's redo it again. Let's do it. Yeah, we got a new cast. And, and Doug Peterson for Tom Coughlin. <laughs> That Trevor Lawrence from Mark Brunel. There's so many similarities. It's like to remaking 96. the Longest Yard movie. You know what I mean? Just uh, let's just recast a couple of them. Uh, Tony Baselli's still calling the game, so he's like the cameo. Yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so many similarities. And I know you brought that up during the year, but when you actually go back and look it's, at it, it's wild. It's crazy. It's wild when you start looking at all the parallels and you go through the season. You're like, 
this is insane how many just parallels there are between these two seasons that is just so close where you keep going and you're like, oh, forgot, here's another one. Yeah, uh, here we go again. Uh, 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 uh. And, you know, it, I think it'll be a beautiful run if they do go into Kansas City, pull off the upset, get the win, and then go into the AFC Championship game. And maybe at that point, you know, you got a 50 50 shot against mm-hmm. whoever you play in that next round. Um, you get a 50-50 shot, maybe you rewrite the ending of the thing. Yeah. I mean, that in 96, they lost in the AFC Championship game. Uh, maybe this go-round, maybe they make it to the bowl. Right. Mm. So Jacksonville was 12.5-point underdogs, and they went to uh, to Denver and played John Elway and the Broncos. And I remember watching that game from start to finish, and you just knew that that was going to be a blowout. You knew, okay, he beat the Bills. Jim Kelly was old. You know, that, that Bills team's kind of at the end of its run old, long and two, just Jaguars teams ascending. You know, Mark Brunell passed for 4,800 yards that season, 96. The offense, uh, the passing game was unbelievable with Jimmy and Keenan. Um, So, Brunell had a great season, led the AFC in passing that season. Trevor's kind of got hot uh, in the second half of the season. So, so many similarities. And again, the Chiefs are eight and a half, nine point favorites Mm -hmm. in this game, coming off a bye, very similar to what uh, those Broncos were. They were impervious that year. I remember Woody Page, a different post columnist, Refer to the Jacksonville Jaguars as Jaguars, and uh, they had no chance. Called them a semi, semi-pro team, and a guy named Mark Brunell was quarterback. Who is this guy? It's just so, it's just so. The disrespect was on another level. And again, the disrespect of the Jaguars this year not as pronounced. But again, people still don't oh, think still the Jaguars no, are real. Nobody's taking them seriously. I mean, the, the only reason that people are even still talking about them is because they've been on this hot streak, mm-hmm. and that comeback last week was just phenomenal. But realistically, very few people are giving them a chance to go into Kansas City, pull off the upset, and get the win. But you know, hey, look, there's a reason why you kind of want to tune out a lot of the national narratives is because they don't watch every game from mm-hmm. the Jaguars. And th- those people will tell you the same thing. They're not watching them week to week. Right. If you watch this team week to week, you know one thing, and that's not to count them out, and that they're going to show up and play their best football in the team in the games where everyone does count them out. And it's not pretty. I mean, their, their, defense, their defense last week, no turnovers. Yeah. Didn't force anything. Right. Gave up 30 points. And it, but, again, a few of those were on short fields. Okay. That but, defense, the defense did not give up 30 points. Yeah, the defense points. did not Trevor give up. Trevor Lawrence gave up a bunch <laughs> of points. And that, that the, and Trevor Lawrence gave up 14, and Chris Claybrooks gave up another one. The defense didn't give up 30. Right. They, I mean, they, they did. They gave up three touchdowns. Only two of, two of them came on less than 20-yard drive. Mm-hmm. Only one of them. They went 62 yards on one touchdown drive. One went six yards. Mm-hmm. Ain't many defenses in the NFL going to keep a team from going six yards. Uh, and the other the, one was like 21, the other one 16? Was, no, it was 17. 17. Se- 16 or 17, something like that. So, again, less than 20-yard field. The defense had no room for errors. And, and, yeah, they'll tell you, oh, we have to be able to bow up and hold them to a field goal there. Sure. But that's a tough spot to be in. Walk out on the field. They see the end zone. They're in the red zone right. when they start. You can't basically give up anything. So the, the defense didn't. De- didn't, the defense played a phenomenal day. They did. Phenomenal day. Um, and that's why once the Jaguars stopped turning the ball over, all of a sudden the tides turned to the game, the offense is scoring, and the defense was actually given yeah. a long field to work with. You give up three points after halftime in a playoff game. Wow. You gave up three points. They missed a field goal. And keep in mind, that on the drive where they kicked the field goal that they missed, there was a, a, a ticky-tack roughing the passer penalty on Trayvon mm-hmm. Walker that, that ended up extending that drive. So, I mean, that's one that we can debate on all day if you want to, but that 15-yard penalty doesn't happen. Chargers end up punting the ball right. to kick that field goal. So, I mean, I'm just saying the defense, the defense played a great the day, and they, they've well. been on a tear in that confidence and that group through the roof. Uh, they're going to have to to be ready to go this week because uh, Pat Mahomes and Andy Reid are definitely going to have a plan for them just like they did uh, back the first go-around. But but I don't think this is as lopsided of a game as people want to lead it to be. Let's go. Let's take a look at. So we're going to take a look at, at uh, the Chiefs depth chart and the Jaguars depth chart. And the first time, let's let's pick which team has the advantage at a position. Okay. Let's do that. So I think we can start at quarterback. We you know it's the comparison between Trevor Lawrence and Pat Mahomes. And while everybody's high on Trevor Lawrence, and if I'm picking the quarterback for the, maybe the next ten years, just because Pat's closer to thirty already, you're probably picking Trevor. But Right now, day of, it's tough to go against. Yeah, Mahomes. you can't. You can't go against Patrick no, Mahomes. No. And it, that's he is the that's, guy. I mean, that, that's like picking between a, a, a Porsche and the Cadillac again at this point. Because Trevor, yes. again, he's a guy. You cannot go wrong if you're starting a franchise and you were picking 
you're probably going to pick Patrick Mahomes. But, I mean, Mahomes. Trevor Lawrence yeah. is probably going number two in that draft. Yeah. I mean, that's that's how good these two guys yeah, are. The, the, really, the, the, you know, Jamal said the age thing. And that's, again, yeah, if you're building a franchise and you're thinking for the next 15 years, maybe you go with Trevor over Patrick maybe, Mahomes. But, but that, that, from a pure player standpoint if, for today you're picking pat mahomes and it's not it's not a long yeah, conversation. it's i don't think it's i don't think it's conversation he, I mean, he's very likely the nfl mvp this he's year. already got a super bowl mvp yeah. and nfl mvp he's probably going to win his second nfl mvp this right. year so again i don't think you can go against Patrick Mahomes. so edge Correct. to the chiefs there all right so then we go to running back and the chiefs have isaiah pacheco they kind of use a combination mm-hmm. of him jarek mckinnon who I actually went to high school with uh long story uh, and, and Ronald Jones. So they use a, a combination of those three guys while the, the Jaguars lean more heavily on Travis Etienne and kind of mix in Jamichael Hasty. Uh, Pacheco, uh, a late round draft pick, rookie who's kind of his first coming out party was kind of against the Jaguars right. back then. He's shown that he can run. They don't really get him involved in the passing game much, but neither do the Jaguars or Travis Etienne a, a whole lot. So. I take um, I take Jags. And yeah, I, I give I give Travis Etienne the edge. I think he's the best running back on the field on Saturday night. So I, I give the Jaguars the the edge there. So we're right now agreement. we're at one and one. We're agreement. We're in agreement there. All right, then we go to wide receiver, and this is a spot that that's heavily deba- debated for both teams because the Chiefs lost Tyreek Hill. McCole Hardman has been uh, out and injured for a while now. Looks like he's going to be a, a question mark for this game of whether or not he's back. Um, and then the Jaguars kind of revamped their wide receiver room this offseason, and people are still questioning because, you know, Calvin Ridley's right around the corner, so uh, if they have enough firepower right now. So the Chiefs have Juju Smith-Schuster, Marquez Valdez-Scantling um, as their two main guys. So let's just look at the top two guys. So then for the Jaguars, we'll say Christian Kirk, Zay Jones. Um, I think the best wide receiver on the field is Christian Kirk, right? and I don't think it's close. Uh, I, th- I think he by far is going to be the best wide receiver playing on Saturday. Like Juju, he was okay for, in Pittsburgh when he was the number two guy, but he's just not that dominant kind of guy. And, and Marquez Valdez Scantling, again, deep threat, has some wheels to him, but he doesn't give you a ton. Um, outside of that. When you got Patrick Mahomes throwing you the ball, That's though, an upgrade. That, yeah, that, yeah, that's that, an upgrade. That's an upgrade. Yeah. So I like the Jags receivers over, yeah. over those yeah. guys. On a man-to-man, pound-for-pound Guy to guy basis. Now I think we equalizes on this next position. We're gonna we're gonna talk about in yeah. terms of the aerial threat. It, it definitely does, and I mean, and keep in mind, Kadarius Tony Tony ripped the Jaguars yes. a new one the last go around, um, and he hasn't done you know much in his NFL career besides just kill the Jaguars. Right. So, right. Uh, but where it equalizes next is at tight end where. The Chiefs have Travis Kelsey. The Jaguars have Evan Ingram. Again, not love even. Evan Ingram. I think he, you know, the Jaguars should definitely pay him, keep him around, but not, not in this he's not comparable to Travis Kelsey. No. Again, it, he, just Travis Kelsey good. is a man. He's a Hall of Famer. Jaguars just historically have struggled to defend tight ends. And no right. matter the coaching regime, tight ends have killed the Jaguars. Right. Tight ends have killed the Jaguars. Right. So Travis Kelsey... Evan Ingram again. It's the it's the Mahomes Lawrence debate again. You got a great guy at quarterback, but I mean you're talking a generational kind of tight end over Evan Ingram. So right. Ingram, I'd like to see him back in Jacksonville next year, but he's no Travis Kelsey. And then we'll look at the offensive line as a whole because I mean if we go through position by position for the offensive line, we're kind of starting to get into the weeds, and then that some of that's opinion based because we've watched more Jaguars mm-hmm. offensive line than and then Chiefs. I think as a whole. Um, the Chiefs' offensive line is susceptible, and that's why we see so many different of those plays from Trevor, um, from Pat mm-hmm. Mahomes kind of running for right. his life. But in that same breath, I'd say the Jaguars' offensive line is susceptible, right. and that's why you see so many you, uh, plays where they, he, Trevor's running for you his go life. Back to the, <laughs> you go back to the Super Bowl two years ago, and that Chiefs' offensive line lost them the Super Bowl. I mean, mm-hmm. absolutely lost them the Super Bowl. And you, Again, you rebuild that, that offensive line, it's better. Of course, it still has some issues. But, again, that's why Patrick Mahomes is scrambling. You see him make these wizard throws and right. runs. It's because he has to to get out of that situation. The offensive line, not nearly as bad as, bad as it was when they played the Bucks in the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. And the Bucks just feasted on Patrick Mahomes. That was just unbelievable performance. The offensive line lost the Chiefs the Super Bowl. Right. And, and- – 
Keep in mind, now, I, I'm going to actually give the Chiefs the edge in this one just because of the matchup with the Jaguars' defensive line as opposed to the Jaguars' matchup with the Chiefs' def- defensive line. I think Chris Jones is yeah, one of the best in the, in the NFL. So I, I'm going to give the, the Chiefs' offensive line the edge. But, I mean, it's not a far one. I mean, because I don't, I don't think it's that great of a group. I think Walker Little has been playing off the charts. Mm-hmm. Jawan Taylor has been playing out of his mind. He's going to get paid this offseason. Uh, Brandon Sheriff, the only question with him is just how healthy he is. He's been on the injury report the cast left full weeks. Luke Fortner popped up on the injury report. So uh, we do have some, some health questions on the Jaguars' offensive line, and they're missing a couple of starters because Tyler Shatley, mm-hmm. while he has been starting most of the year, wasn't originally installed as the guy. Right. So, uh, again, I'm in agreement with you. Chris Jones against the Jaguars' offensive line. As great as Walker Little played against Khalil Mack, Joey Bosa, I mean, that situation scares me. Luke Fortner's a rookie, popped up on the injury report. Right. He's played phenomenal this year. As, I mean, I mean, Brandon Sheriff said he's, he's a veteran out there sure. already. So, again, but, I mean, Chris Jones, you're talking about a very, to me, a similar situation as a Travis Kelsey on the Jacksonville defense. Right. You're talking about a foundational player at that position, and it, it's just not even close. I mean, I like, I mean, Chris Jones, maybe, I mean, right behind Aaron Donald, best defensive tackle in the NFL. So, again, I think the when you're measuring, I think Jaguars' offensive line is fine. I mean, they, they, you mentioned Jawan Taylor, Walker Little, what he's done. Cam Robinson was playing well before his injury. But, again, when you're having to, to hold off that Chris Jones kind of guy, right. he changes so much on that defensive line. And you right. don't have to follow the Chiefs week to week to see what he's done. And we saw what happened the first time he played the Jaguars, too. Right. And so now we get kind of switch the script, and we're going to head to the defense. Uh, for the defense, the big question marks are uh, where do you compile the defensive line? And again, we'll do the defensive line kind of as a, as a cluster because I think both of these teams are going to spend more time in nickel than anything else because just for the style of offense both teams mm-hmm. play. Uh, for the defensive line with the Chiefs, the main guy is Chris Jones. Yes. End all, be all. He's their best guy, their best player. And when you look at the Jaguars' defensive line, there is no one comparable in stature and impact to Chris Jones. Now, when you say the three other guys, since both of these teams tend to play four down linemen when they're in nickel, I would say that the Jaguars' other three are just as good, if not better, than the Chiefs' other three. Right. Um, So when you start talking about Trayvon Walker's, uh, Josh Allen's, Roy Robertson Harris's, Devon Hamilton compared to to what Frank Clark gives mm-hmm. you, Mike Dana, um, those kind of players for the Chiefs. I think those three are more comparable than than Chris Jones, and I would give the Chiefs the edge because of the Chris Jones oh, yeah. factor. I, I don't think that's even uh, a comparison there. I mean, yeah. Chris Jones is such a game changer. You know, and, and I know people will look at Trayvon Walker's rookie season as somewhat of a disappointment. He was, you know, Pepsi Rookie of the Year nominations came out this year. Trayvon was not on there. Aiden Hutchinson was. But Trayvon Walker, although he's made some some bad plays this year, he's been whistled for some some questionable penalties, some sure. stupid mistakes. Last week, I look at the the Roy Robertson Harris sack on first down on the Chargers' last drive, and Trayvon Walker, his his penetration, he's playing more on that defensive line, hand in the dirt kind of position. Yes, and he is actually making impact. He's changing plays, and the Trayvon Walker pressure last week allowed Roy Robertson Harris to get in and sack Justin Herbert on that crucial first down. A loss of eight puts him in a second and 18. We know what happened that drive. They came up five yards short on third down. And fourth, th- fourth and five, you got to punt the way, give Trevor the ball at his own 21, game-winning drive. So Trayvon Walker making an impact. Again, not statistically so much as like an Aiden Hutchinson. He's not getting those you know, right. two, three sacks a game. He is changing the play. So I do like Trayvon more as a down lineman. Well, here and here's the thing, and you know, I, and I don't want to derail us too long getting into the weeds. Like, I talked to Ar- Arden Key yesterday in the locker room. I asked him, you know, what's really jump-started the Jaguars' pass rush the past few weeks? And he said, I think we found our own as like a four-down team. And what he means is at, they started the year looking at it as a 3-4 mm-hmm. with these stand-up outside linebackers, and now they've kind of switched because they see that, you know, in nickel, they generally played four down, but now they're playing that more consistently just because they say their personnel is more comfortable there, mm-hmm. specifically a guy like Trayvon Walker. Right. They're simplifying the game for him, letting him go forward instead of asking him to go back and side to side as much. Um, and the one thing that we kind of knew about Trayvon going in, and this is what he excelled at in Georgia, at Georgia, was never filling the stat sheet for himself 
but opening up other people to be able to right. do that. And while he will make that play where he slices into the backfield and ends up getting held and forced that holding call and things like that, he is powerful and impactful from standpoints, but he is a bulldozer who can open up things and attract attention for other people. To me, and, that, and that's why I didn't understand the uh, when you're drafting him and you're putting at him at an outside backer position. It, sure. To me, it just didn't, it, it wasn't a natural fit to me when you already had a Josh Allen there and uh, Trayvon, he kind of was a rover on in, Well, there's in a need. Oh, there is a need, there, but there's... I don't think Trayvon was, was that outside backer kind of guy. He looks more natural to me as a down, hand in the dirt defensive line. I think the goal for him is when you look at the athletic ability, like, I mean, think about it. We raved about his coverage ability against mm-hmm. the Chargers in week three. He drops back in the coverage. Big pass breakup. The goal for him is to be able to be this like movable chess piece that teams don't know where the Jaguars are going to line him up because he is so big, so athletic, and can do so many things at a solid level. The problem is you drop all that on his plate maybe too fast or you put him in a position that wasn't simple enough to start. I agree with you. I, I, I always compared him to or said that he could be the Jaguars' version of like Justin Smith. Mm-hmm. Um, Justin Smith did you know, fill up the stat sheet in right. his career. But, I mean, toward the later days of his career, which is what I was saying Trayvon could be, he was more of a bulldozer who cleared the way for Alden Smith to be able right. to do things for the 49ers at the time. Trent Bulky guy. Yeah, a Trent Bulky guy. It, it, and that's where I was looking at the comparison right. from was because Trent Bulky was the guy pulling the strings behind all of that while they were doing it. So um, that's what I was kind of looking at from from him. But they decided to go a different route and use him as this powerful edge player. And we have seen NFL teams like need to account yeah, for it, chipping him, double teaming him. And they're showing the respect even though the stats aren't there, which is good. And if you go back and look at all the sacks for Aiden Hutchinson that he got this year, realistically, a lot of them weren't because he did great things. Like he got a sack against the Jaguars because nobody blocked him. Like, it, it was just a, a, a brain fart from Cam Robinson on the play. And there are a number of plays like that where maybe he just doesn't, he just didn't quit on the play and looped around and was able to finally get there. It's not this great play by Aiden Hutchinson. Not to say that he's not a good player, mm-hmm. but I think the stats tell a little bit of a different story when you just look at the raw numbers than when you go back and look at how he got them. As opposed to where Trayvon, they're not scheming him to come off, come off the edge unblocked. They're not doing that. They're allowing him to go ahead and try and open up things on these stunts for other right. people. So, uh, again, we got we started yeah, to get, yeah, we okay. got derailed we, a little bit. Derailed. Okay. I, I, I do think Trayvon is going to be a good player. Um, this offseason is going to be key for him. He has to figure out how to be a little bit more of a pass rusher, and I think some of it is a comfort thing. Like some of the coaches have said, you know, we see these pass rush moves from him in practice, but we don't see him with the willingness to use them on the game field. And I think we were talking about this on another subject earlier today, and I think part of it is fear of failure. And, you know, he's not comfortable with doing that on the field because what if it doesn't work? Right. And he's not thinking about what if it does. So I think that's why, the, you know, the coaching staff kind of scratching their head. is like, why do we see him do this in practice? We see all these moves. And even when he was hurt, he was te- like some of the other players were telling me, you know, Trayvon was on the sideline. He was telling guys like, hey, you know, when you go back out there, try this move. You, you know, you got him set up. He's, this one's going to work. And then when we go out there, you see him on the field. You just see him bulldoze straight into right. a guy and you don't see any moves. So I think there's there's a level of comfort and belief that has to kind of flip the switch. And if he already is doing those things in practice, he just needs to put them into utilization on the game field and – the hope is that maybe that's right. next year, but I, I, I do think that I don't think it's as bad as the stat sheet says it is. For Agree, I, and, it, and I, I throw it back to that play again. Did not get any stats on the play, right. but he made Justin Herbert step up in that pocket, move to his right, move back to his left, and then what happened? Roy Robertson Harrison brings him down. Right, and again, those plays are the impact plays. I mean, Trayvon has had those types of plays before where yeah. he's thrown a penalty or something like that. I mean, so, against the Titans, I, I like. And again, I don't want to compare it to a guy that hasn't been here in Jacksonville. I don't think the Jaguars win that game with any other rookie edge. I mean, we can say Aiden Hutchinson by name. I don't think the Jaguars beat the Titans with Aiden Hutchinson at defensive end because Trayvon Walker was wreaking havoc in the running game. He was able to use his length to bring down Derrick Henry and cause problems. I mean, think about the big Derrick Henry run that never was. He caused a holding penalty. And there, there was another impactful play where he was held that 
brought it back for the Titans. I don't see Aiden Hutchinson making that same sort of impact in the running game in order to give the Jaguars that lift they needed. Again, getting off subject and getting into the weeds, but I, I, I think Trayvon was the right guy. I think he's going to be a better player next year than he is this year, and that was, like, I know it gets cloudy once we've been in this long season, right. but if you think back before the season started, a lot of people were saying the same thing then. Like, he's this impactful, moldable piece of clay where you had to kind of temper your expectations for year one with the understanding that, A, now he's in an NFL weightlifting program, an uh, NFL conditioning program, and now he's not being a student athlete. He is just an athlete who can work on his In game. banking terms, he's a he's a five-year CD or something, something like that. Like he's that. a stock. You sit in there. And it's going to pay off. He's going to pay off eventually over time. Right. So maybe not this year. You, you, you withdraw it this year. You're going to get penalized. You don't get your full return. Right. So Trayvon is, is that two, three-year investment. All right, back on track. Uh, We did the defensive line. We gave the Chiefs the edge there. But when we go to linebackers, that's where the Jaguars kind of take back over. Again, we're only going to mention kind of two linebackers here. So for them, it would be Willie Gay and Nick Bolton. For the Jaguars, it's going to be – we'll do Devin Lloyd and we'll do Foyer Aluakun. I'm giving the Jaguars the edge, and I don't think it's close. I don't think think Foyer has been a phenomenal player for the Jaguars. He's going to have his hands full because they're going to need him and Lloyd to do a very good job of keeping an eye on Travis Kelsey. But I am giving them the the huge edge. Foyer has been huge for this defense, not to say that Nick Bolton is not big for the Chiefs, but I think Foyer is very underrated around the league. He is phenomenal. Phenomenal. Still one of the best quotes I've heard all year about the comeback last week. Didn't like the odds, but loved our chances. That's it. And that kind of summarizes this year's Jaguars team. All right. And then when you go to the secondary, uh, you kind of have to look at it. We'll we'll look at it as a whole. So, what, they have Ladarius Sneed, Juan Thornton, Justin Reed, Trent McDuffie. Uh, we'll go with Rayshon Jenkins, Andre Sisco at safety, and then um, Tyson Campbell and Darius Williams on the outside. I like, I like the and, Jags. And you give the Jaguars day. the edge there, too. I mean, the Chiefs secondary has had issues mm-hmm. galore this season. That Steve Spagnuolo defense, they're going to rush four a lot. They're going to put that secondary, drop it into coverage to do things, and it's on, it's on them to make a lot of adjustments. They need smart pieces that can adjust in the secondary, and it puts pressure on them to make right. the right adjustments. Right. Um, and at times we've seen this Chiefs defense not able to do that, and that's why the Chiefs end up in so many shootouts. Right. The Jaguars defense, similar in, in aspects, but not as much pressure on the secondary to make quite as many right. adjustments. We've seen them make the wrong adjustments <laughs> and, and be in the wrong place <laughs> a, a few times, but... Uh, as the season has gone on, those mistakes have become fewer and farther between, and players are understanding where everyone is supposed to be yes. better. So then when one guy does make a mistake, you're able to go back and see someone else fill in for him. For instance, against the Cowboys, Rayshon Jenkins makes the game-winning play, right. pick six. He was in the wrong spot. Both of those guys have also <laughs> received, uh, Rayshon and also Tyson Campbell, received all pro votes. Mm-hmm. So, again, there is respect for those guys, Foyer Very as good. well. So there is respect among those guys right. in that secondary, in that linebacking core. So I do like Jacksonville's back end better than I like the Chiefs. Right. And overall, I mean, I think we've gone through the, just about the entire roster here. and Specialists, we, this is tough because Harrison Butker, pretty darn pretty solid good. kicker. I'd give him the edge over Riley, but I'd give Logan Cook the, the edge over Harrison. Um so, I mean, it, we, we've pretty much gone through all of it. I think we've leaned Jaguars a little bit more here than uh, than Chiefs. I haven't kept exact count, but I think right. we, we've leaned but, more Jags. But the, the Chiefs, where they make up that ground is... Pat Mahomes. Pat Mahomes, <laughs> Travis Kelsey, yes. Chris Jones. Yeah. I mean, those, those, those three, three players, the gaps between the Jaguars comparison is, is, is massive. It's massive. massive. So, I mean, Travis Kelsey is going to be a handful. I mean, he didn't get loose against the Jaguars in the first go-around. But he, except for maybe that one big play where Devin Lloyd kind of just botched the coverage, and that was part of the reason why he started getting pulled and switching out. He had a Chad big game, Moma. though. He, he, so, <laughs> so we'll see if, uh, if this go around they can kind of sure up some of those things. And, I mean, really, a lot of the, thing, the big plays for the Chiefs were just simple mistakes by the Jags defense. They haven't been making those mistakes as of late. They have the athletes, and the Jaguars have spent the money to have the athletes to have a good defense. The question isn't can they shut down the Chiefs. The question is can they force them to kick more threes right. than let them score touchdowns. Yeah. The Chiefs are going to score. I mean, they're they're, they're going to put up 35, 40 points in this game. Yes. 
the Jaguars just to have to, to stay in front of them. Yeah. And it, this is not going to be a game you're going to beat them. And you know, saw what happened last time. You can't settle even, for field goals. I'm not even sure that you want to be in front of them the whole way. To be 100% honest, I, I mean, I, I was thinking about this the other day, and as crazy as it sounds, with the Chiefs, because if you're out front, then they just put it on Pat Mahomes' yeah. yeah. arm. And I don't know if this Jaguars defense can hold up if Pat throws 70 times. But... Conversely, if you let them get out front, then you get a little Isaiah Pacheco mixed in, and they run the ball, and they don't feel maybe the as much pressure to put in. You just need to stay within striking distance and say, "We'll score last." Right. And Doug, you know, Doug, <laughs> Doug mentioned this week you can't you can't let that happen. What happened last week? No, not, I mean no, that no, that was no, such no. an aberration. You're, you're not going to be minus five in in many, if any, games ever in the future, and be able to come back and win that game. And that goes. I mean, I think if you're minus two in this game, you lose this game right. against Kansas City. I mean, Patrick Mahomes is so deadly, so effective. You're playing at home, crazy environment. And again, Jacksonville lost by 10 up there before when they did not play a good game. So I think we 10, again, feels so long ago. The, the, the metamorphosis from Jacksonville in those the nine weeks since then has been night and day. I mean, they've been a different team since they come back from the bye. So I'm interested to see, you know, Jacksonville did not play its best game against the Chiefs, and they lost by 10 before. I like their chances a lot more this time, just from how they've, they've matured over these last nine weeks of the season. Right. They feel like a completely different team. They're on the ascent. I keep using that word ascent because they are just on the incline, yep. um, and I think it's going to be a great game on Saturday. Yeah, I've, I've already kind of revealed. I'm going to pick the Jaguars to win this game. We, we probably won't do our picks today, but at some point, I, I mean, it, Playing, playing some, I'm going to pick them. The one. question is, will he pick Jamal Agnew to house when he, uh, so, he got burned I, last look, week? Yeah, I did. I did get burned by that one last week, but that's okay. I, look, I, I think the key for the Jags this week is a. You do want to get into a shootout in this one. You need Trevor Lawrence to be able to keep pace, but you need Travis Etienne to get rolling. If Travis Etienne can go out there and have a big game, then you almost need to borrow a little bit of the Titans game plan from when they came to Jacksonville. Slow down the game. Play a physical, slow football game. Right. Because the less time that uh, Pat Mahomes has to operate, the better. That's what you want. Yes. You, that don't, is you exactly don't want Patrick you want. Mahomes with the ball throwing 50 times in this no. game. You want him to throw 25 passes, and you want to ball control him to death. Right. That is, that is exactly what they need to do. All right. Uh, we'll have plenty of coverage coming your way over on NewsForJax.com and Channel 4. Uh, for now, we'll sign off. See you.